In today's video, we're going to be looking at a scientific publication that studied the vocal tracks of amateur and professional saxophonists as they played various notes throughout the normal range and altissimo registers. Of all the videos released on this channel, the one on voicing has been the most popular, so I wanted to go back and take a more rigorous scientific look at this topic. But don't worry if science isn't your thing because this is all going to be very easy to understand. And you're likely to walk away from the video with an appreciation for the physics involved in playing the instrument. A quick recap, what is voicing? You'll hear this term tossed around a lot in saxophone circles, especially in regards to playing overtones or the upper register. I would summarize it as an awareness of the tongue and overall oral cavity while playing and the ability to subtly manipulate these factors. If you'd like to learn more about this topic, definitely check out the previous video on voicing from this channel. So as many of us find out when first attempting overtones or notes in the altissimo register, it takes quite a bit of time for this skill to develop. You may be experiencing some frustration right now where there is a certain overtone you can't get past or a high note that just won't speak. But what is happening exactly that makes this easier or harder for certain players? The research article we're going to look at answers exactly that. The title of the paper being Saxophonist Tune Vocal Tract Resonances in advanced performance techniques. In order to understand this, we have to learn about something called acoustic impedance, which is basically a measure of the acoustic characteristics inherent to an instrument. Acoustic impedance is measured across a wide range of frequencies called a spectrum. So to better understand this topic, let's consider the acoustic impedance spectra of a tenor saxophone compared to a clarinet. An acoustic impedance spectrum can be measured for any note. And in this figure, the two instruments are compared using the last notes in their respective ranges before starting to use the octave key or register key in the case of the clarinet. For the saxophone, this is middle D, using just the palm key D fingering without the octave key, and it is an A sharp on clarinet. In both of these spectra, there are strong impedance peaks in the low frequency region, corresponding to the fundamental and first few overtones of that note's harmonic series. Notice how in the saxophone spectrum, the peaks are closer together than the clarinets. This is because the overtones of the harmonic series on a clarinet are more spread apart than they are on a saxophone. It is also the reason why the clarinet has a register key and not an octave key, because the first overtone is an octave and a fifth above the fundamental. More importantly for us in this video is the high frequency region where we can see that the clarinet has several strong peaks corresponding to the highest overtones, whereas they are very weak on the saxophone. And this right here explains a very important observation that anybody who has played both instruments will be well aware of. The standard written range of the clarinet is three and a half octaves, while the saxophone is only two and a half. Even if you are an inexperienced clarinetist, chances are you can play at least three octaves without too much difficulty. On the contrary, it takes quite a bit of work to gain control over the saxophone's third octave. If the saxophone exhibited strong resonances in the high frequency range of the acoustic impedance spectrum, like the clarinet, the altissimo register would be much easier to produce. But since it does not, how do we produce these tones? Now in physics, acoustic impedance is represented as capital Z, and it's possible to model the acoustic impedance load on the reed, Z load, as the sum of the acoustic impedances of the vocal tract and saxophone bore in parallel with the acoustic impedance of the reed. To simplify this, let's just consider one part of the equation, Z tract and Z bore. By using a custom designed mouthpiece for a tenor saxophone, the authors were able to measure acoustic impedance inside a player's mouth and demonstrate definitively that the vocal tract plays a major role in producing the highest notes on the saxophone. But first, let's take a look at the normal range. Here we have D6, or what we usually call palm key D. The thick gray line is Z bore for the saxophone with the palm key D fingering. Remember that every time we change the fingering, we change the dimensions of the saxophone's bore where the sound wave is resonating. The black line is the acoustic impedance inside the player's mouth. And do you see those sharp peaks at 522 and 1044 hertz? Those aren't actually real measurements. The sensors that were measuring Z mouth also picked up the sound of high D being produced by the saxophone. In science, when things appear in a spectrum that are not actually part of the measurement, we call them artifacts. But the authors left these artifacts in the spectrum so we could easily see the harmonics of the note being played. This is also very helpful because we can see the relation of the sound being produced by the saxophone to the resonance peak in the acoustic impedance spectrum corresponding to high D. What I mean by that is, the saxophone sounds a high D because there is a resonance for that pitch in the acoustic impedance spectrum for that fingering. 
If we remove these peaks from the high D sound wave, we get the real Z mouth measurement, which as we can see, doesn't really have any relation to Z bore for the high D fingering. When you add the spectra of Z mouth and Z bore together, shown in the dotted line, we can see that it almost exactly follows Z bore by itself, which means the vocal tract doesn't contribute a whole lot to the playing of a high D. Let's look at another note in the normal range, high C. Here again, we see a sharp peak from the sound of high C being made by the saxophone, which lines up with the high C resonance peak in the acoustic impedance spectrum. Remove these artifacts, and again, the vocal tract doesn't appear to be contributing to the production of this note. If this is all feeling a bit over your head, hang in there. I promise by the end of the video, everything will make a lot more sense, and you'll finish having learned something that you probably already knew intuitively just from playing the saxophone. And now that you have the basic idea about how to interpret these images, things are about to get very interesting. Here is the acoustic impedance spectrum for low B flat, and a couple examples of Z mouth, when a saxophonist played the higher overtones of that note. Like before, the very sharp peaks we see are from the sound of the notes being played. The numbers represent the corresponding overtone of low B flat. So 7 is altissimo A flat, and 10, 11, and 12 are altissimo D, E, or a sharp E flat, and F. Let's remove the artifacts to get the real Z mouth measurements, and now we see something very different. Unlike the notes in the basic range, there is a strong and broad resonance frequency coming from the player's mouth that is much larger than the corresponding peaks in the acoustic impedance spectrum of the bore. This is really an amazing measurement because it shows quantitatively how the vocal tract is playing a major role in the production of the saxophone's highest notes. While we're on this figure, there is something else important we can learn from the acoustic impedance spectrum of low B flat. Have you ever noticed that it's actually much easier to play the second overtone of low B flat? than it is to play the fundamental. Or if you try to play low B flat very quietly, you're more likely to get the first overtone. The reason why a particular fingering in the basic range produces a specific pitch is because the acoustic impedance spectrum of that note has a resonance at that frequency. Looking at the spectrum for high C, notice that the strongest impedance peak is at the same frequency as the note being sounded on the saxophone. Incidentally, the purpose of the octave key is to make the resonance for middle C weaker so we get the first overtone instead of the fundamental. Now let's look at low B flat again. The strongest resonance in the spectrum is actually for the second overtone, and the first overtone is also stronger than the fundamental. So both of these pitches are easier to produce, especially when playing quietly. Moving to the higher frequencies of the spectrum, there are more resonances corresponding to the higher overtones, but the only way to get them to sound is to amplify their strength using the vocal tract. This experiment was performed playing altissimo C, and the same phenomenon is seen when you move beyond the so-called basic range. There is a weak resonance at a high frequency which is unable to support stable oscillations of the reed. So the player tunes a strong resonance near that frequency, and the result is that the saxophone sounds a high pitch that is above its normal range. And with that, we can better understand why the title of this paper is Saxophonist Tune Vocal Track Resonances in Advanced Performance Techniques. Another fascinating observation from this experiment was in regards to who was playing the saxophone. All of the measurements were taken with both amateur and professional players, and as you might expect, it was only the experts that were able to play the overtones and in the altissimo register. So this is all very interesting, but what do we do with this information as saxophonists? On one hand, these experiments empirically confirm many of the things saxophonists report experiencing when playing the instrument. On the other hand, the saxophone is played by feel, not theory. So how do we learn these techniques and incorporate them into our playing? The tried and true way that many players have used to develop control over the higher harmonics of the saxophone has been the study of the overtone series. This is probably most commonly practiced by fingering a low B flat and then trying to play the overtones as high as possible. <laughs> Then usually, the same process is followed for low B, C, C sharp, and sometimes D. If you're new to this, chances are you'll start experiencing difficulties moving past the fourth or fifth overtone of low B flat, which incidentally is something the researchers observed with the amateur players in the study we talked about. Personally, I was stuck at this point for many years, but I found another angle from which you can approach the overtones that allowed me to make much more progress much faster than I had before. Instead of trying to play the overtones as high as possible from the lowest fingering, play the lowest overtones on every fingering on the horn and then gradually move up from there. So what I mean by that is, start by learning the first overtones of every fingering, which is essentially just playing the second octave without the octave key. <laughs> 
Try to get up to at least a high C and then continue into the palm keys if you can, then go back to low B flat and do the second overtones. Again, once you get to about a C and a little higher if possible, go back down and do the third overtones. The advantage of doing this is that you learn the entire harmonic series of the saxophone on every note instead of just being limited to the lowest ones. Throughout this process, you can periodically try some notes in the altissimo register, and you might be pleasantly surprised at what comes out. There will be times where you feel like you're just not getting it, but keep trying, because this is a gradual process where you're slowly building an awareness of very subtle musculature in the oral cavity. At that point, you'll know exactly what other players mean when they say they use voicing to play a high note. But I want to end this video on a more controversial note. One of my saxophone idols is Lenny Pickett, a great musician on so many levels, that has previously described the concept of voicing as a fake out the teachers use to get their students to become familiar with the sensation of playing in the high register. He says, ultimately, if you want to play the high notes, you have to learn to increase and control the speed of the airstream. And I think he has a great point here, because it is really the air that is responsible for the saxophone sound. While it is true that there may be something going on with the vocal tract, as discussed in the research paper, it is the air that does the work. In my own experience learning the concept of voicing, the air was kind of taken for granted and it turned out I wasn't really supplying a free-flowing airstream to the instrument, which was ultimately the cause of many of my problems. As you're practicing the exercises from this video, pay attention to what the vocal tract feels like while playing, but don't forget to always supply a strong and steady airstream to the instrument. If you're interested in the exercises from this video and like to go one step further, I have a method book available that systematically lays out a process for you to develop better control over your saxophone and build a range into the fifth octave and beyond, which you can check out in the link below. Or if you're just curious and would like to learn more about my philosophy of playing, there is a free mini ebook available that can help you start playing more efficiently right away. I also want to announce that Supersonic Sax is now on Buy Me A Coffee. So if you'd like to support this channel financially so I can spend more time creating content like this, please consider doing so as any support from this community would be greatly appreciated. So start practicing those overtones, and before you know it, you'll start becoming aware of subtle aspects of the saxophone that will take your playing to the next level.